So uh, our, our final talk today, uh, by the way, it's not for an hour and 45 minutes. That was my own uh, error with the time. Uh, our next speaker, who has, also has the same amount of time as everyone else, is Rajesh uh, Sundarasan, who uh, is on sabbatical uh, in Illinois right now. Uh, she's uh, at ISC Bangalore, where I was lucky to spend nine months uh, many years ago. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. But, uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, so what I'm going to speak about is something that Tara dismissed as uh, not an interesting viewpoint to her. This is about the Chernoffian viewpoint. And I'll say that the Chernoff viewpoint is still interesting with some real experiments. So, so let's actually begin with uh, a real experiment. And the mute is off. Right? The mute is off, yes. Okay, so let's uh, start with the real experiment. So in here, uh, uh, in what I'm going to display, you'll see about 20 images. And I need a wall, um, 19 of them are the same. And the one image is going to be different. And you have to find out which one is the odd one. And I need a volunteer, so let me volunteer Tara. <laughs> <laughs> but I know a little bit about your experiment. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay, maybe we should choose somebody else. So, Vivek, uh, would you like to be the volunteer? Once you find out where the odd one is, just put up your hand. Okay, ready? Uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah. So, one, two, three, go. Where's the odd one? Yes, so where is the odd one? Where's the odd one? Yes, so where is the odd one? It's in the second row and uh, uh, fourth <coughs> column. Okay, so he took some time, but he was able to figure it out nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do another experiment. So we wake once again. So, ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. So it's, it's, yeah, it's at the two, two point. Okay, he's getting quicker at this, so that's good. <laughs> so we'll do it once more. Clearly the optimal strategy is to first raise your hand, and then when you say which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm relying on Vivek's that's integrity the here. The best human Jeopardy players do. The first design of IBM Watson didn't account for that, but the best player first presses the button. And then and thinks then about the right <laughs> answer, yeah. And it took that to heart and really po did poorly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see the third experiment. Yeah. Okay, so actually this one is supposed to be the easiest, but uh, I think Vivek got a little tired, so. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's here, the odd one's here, and. Uh, <laughs> he does a real sequential search. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these are actually real experiments that uh, some experiment has conducted. Uh, so let me go back to the first slide, and what I'm going to talk about is uh, some the outcome of some discussions and some work that I have done with a student and a neuroscientist, Arun Sripati. Okay. So the the point here is that uh, uh, there were some images where one took a little longer to find out where the odd one was, and there were some others where it was much easier to find out where the odd one was. And most people find it uh, find the first one a little difficult. Uh, this one is a little easier and the third one the easiest. Okay, And uh, perhaps the reason uh, for this is uh, if you look at the diamonds and the X's, these are in some sense vastly different. You, you'll be able to recognize their differences much easier than in these cases where you get some artificial images that you don't recognize and you have to look a little deeper. Okay? So uh, this uh, friend of mine and uh, uh, a colleague who's a neuroscientist, Arun Sripati, he, in his work with uh, uh, Olson uh, during his uh, postdoc at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, hypothesized that visual search uh, performance depends on the similarity of two images. Okay, that's uh, a natural thing to guess. But then they also went one step further and said that the similarity can be measured in terms of neuronal activities in the visual cortex. And this is in response to each of the two images. Okay. So uh, to be a little more precise, the time to identify the odd one out is going to depend on the similarity of the neuronal responses. So this is going one step deeper than what uh, Tara was speaking about. So we're going to talk about neuronal responses here to this image versus this image, or this image versus this image, or this image versus this image. 
And in doing this, uh, the, the choice of these images, uh, these are somewhat artificial because to some extent, uh, we can instantly recognize certain uh, types of images and we have to essentially make the subjects look at these images and, and uh, kind of accumulate a certain amount of confidence before they can determine where the odd one is. As uh, uh, Max pointed out in his comment, there are some things that we just recognize instantaneously. We want to essentially avoid such, circum uh, such circumstances and therefore we pick images of this sort which are somewhat artificial. Okay, so let's uh, go a little further. Um, so the time to identify the odd one depends on the similarity of the neuronal responses to either this or uh, uh, to this versus this and so on. But where are we going to get the neuronal responses from? Uh, so what these two people did was uh, they actually looked at uh, uh, Macox, rhesus Macox. These are available in plenty in India. And uh, I think the experiments were essentially conducted on those that originally came from India. And they were done in Carnegie Mellon University. This picture is from uh, uh, the Oxford University uh, uh, publication. It's a picture, it's a schematic of the Macock, recent Macock uh, brain. Just to uh, orient ourselves, uh, the eyes are somewhere here. And uh, the, the visual pathway is essentially uh, the sensory input from here goes all the way from here to the back of the brain. So that's the V1 region, the, uh, something that Todd uh, mentioned in his talk as well. This essentially gets some uh, very fine, uh, uh, you don't get much, uh, uh, it is believed that we don't get much information from there, but there is some uh, information that flows to this particular region called the inferotemporal cortex where certain visual features emerge. Okay. And then these visual features, uh, uh, information about them goes to the prefrontal cortex which essentially does some face and object uh, uh, recognition and then responds uh, to them. So uh, this schematic uh, will, um, will be a useful picture to keep in mind. And here's the experiment that uh, Sripati and uh, Olson did. And uh, what, what they did was they surgically uh, fitted the two macaques with a cranial implant to record neuronal activity. Okay. And they also fitted uh, uh, surgically uh, uh, a scleral search coil on the, uh, on the eyes to record eye movements you know, so that one could figure out where the uh, macaques were focusing on. They did some experiments which essentially collected the neuronal activity and I'm going to tell you what those experiments are. And these were, uh, uh, before they went, went, uh, went ahead and did this, they actually got some clearance to ensure that this was within some uh, 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 guidelines that was set by the CMU Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Uh, this can be reassuring to some but uh, uh, maybe not to everyone but nevertheless it was uh, uh, cleared by this particular committee. Data was collected over several days and uh, before each day's experiment what they did was they inserted an electrode so that the tip was about one centimeter from the inferotemporal cortex. Okay, So the inferotemporal cortex is this area and uh, they inserted something from the top and it was about one centimeter from this particular uh, region. West of the brain? Yeah. So it can be reassuring to some but not to others. So the electrodes were pushed in such a way that uh, they could, uh, uh, reap, uh, yeah, the next day if you wanted to go to the same region, you could essentially do it uh, in a reproducible fashion so that you are recording from the same uh, region. And these were done along tracks such that uh, the grid that they were recording over was of one millimeter spa uh, spacing. When you record this neuronal activity, you're going to essentially get, uh, uh, these are responses to some images, which I will show in the next slide. But whatever these responses are, it's going to be a composite response of several neurons. And they had some means by which they could isolate the spikes of individual neurons. And this is uh, some commonly available uh, software. So they used uh, this to identify uh, how each of the neurons were uh, res responding in this area. Yeah, they had isolated a certain number of neurons. I'll come to that in a minute. So this was the experiment that they did. Uh, the macaques were trained to fixate on the plus sign. 
Okay, so what they wanted to get was some subliminal activity uh, uh, while the macaque is essentially focusing on this plus. And while that's happening, a series of images were shown. Uh, each of these images was on for 200 milliseconds and then off. And then, uh, then another image came and uh, was on for 200 milliseconds and so on. And this experiment would last about two seconds. And uh, in order to ensure that uh, the macaques were focusing on this plus, at the end of the experiment, at the end of a two second period, they would get a drop of juice. We all want reward, uh, so we are no different from the macaques in that respect. Um, so uh, a drop of juice ensured that they were focused on the plus sign. Mm -hmm. uh, and while this is happening, uh, the neurons responding to these images, which are uh, in the background, so to speak, are uh, the neurons responding to these images, uh, the, the, the rate of their firings was essentially recorded. So this was the experiment that was done repeatedly over several days. And in the end, what they found was uh, for about 174 neurons, they were able to isolate the uh, firing rates. And uh, the, these firing rates were the response to the six images. They actually collected the data over several other images. Uh, and uh, what I will describe is some results that they had for data collected over 24 images. For uh, the uh, outcome of this experiment is that for each image I, we were able to get the neuronal response for uh, uh, all the 174 neurons. Okay, that's the summary of the uh, findings that they had. And then they came up with this interesting quantity, which was just the L1 distance between the uh, vector of firing rates. So there's a big variation. I mean, these are near distributions. So this is essentially a firing rate. So yeah, so you, you just compute the average rate, and then uh, uh, just have one statistic. Yeah. All these neurons were in the same part of the brain? They were all, uh, 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 it was, yeah, in, they were all in the inferotemporal cortex, but they, um, uh, they recorded from several regions within this inferotemporal cortex. I think the region was about, uh, well, I don't remember the exact uh, dimensions. Uh, the spacing was about one millimeter square. So, so they were able to go within that. It, uh, they did do a lot of poking, I believe, to be able to get this information. But all in the inferotemporal cortex. Yeah. Okay, so this was on the macaque uh, uh, monkeys. Um, on uh, uh, on the other hand, they also did some experiments, like the one that I uh, just uh, st uh, like the one that I started this uh, particular talk with, uh, to find out reaction times. Uh, uh, on human subjects. Again, it was approved by the CMU uh, review board. Don't be in a rush to poke on your on your uh, graduate students' brains, but this is something simpler. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, the human subjects were essentially asked to identify the oddball. Okay, there were six images which were uh, uh, arranged in this form, and you had to identify if, uh, like for example, Vivek Borker would have had to identify where the odd image is, and he would have to say left or right. He would go and hit a key once he identifies where it is. Just as you give monkey juice, you should have given me a bottle of beer. <laughs> <laughs> For graduate students, I think uh, uh, pizza would suffice. By the way, apparently there's a YouTube video of uh, experiments done on chimps. They're faster than humans as visual <laughs> Okay, jokes aside, uh, so uh, the image was d displayed for about um, five seconds and uh, reaction times were collected. Okay, so the reaction time was essentially an average reaction time. Uh, the data was averaged uh, for both oddball image i amongst distractors j and vice versa. So uh, this was the uh, data that was obtained. Uh, did you have a question? No. There's one more ingredient to the exper uh, experiment that they had. Um, we do take some amount of time uh, to, uh, to uh, 
um, to, re to respond and hit the key. So there is some time for motor response. And they had to essentially identify how much this time was and take that off so that you isolate the time for a decision. And this was done, uh, uh, this was identified using this simple experiment. Um, on, on a screen like this, uh, uh, th there would appear a particular uh, circle either to the left or the right. And the subject had to identify whether it was to the left or the right. And the assumption is that this particular decision is instantaneous and most of the time is essentially to respond to hit the key. Okay. So this is uh, the, the average response time is essentially the baseline reaction time. And uh, the overall response time is the time taken to identify the oddball image i amongst distractors j or vice versa as averaged. And from that, you subtract the baseline reaction time. So this essentially gives you the uh, net time to make a decision on where the oddball image is. So the first they would do a bunch of tasks to figure out this baseline reaction time for every single? For every single subject. subject. And then, then yeah. So there were six different subjects. So uh, this can vary quite a bit. So it's really surprising. If, if anything matches, you'll have to be surprised that it indeed does. Uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. So their punch line is really a straight line. Okay. So uh, here on this side is essentially the inverse of uh, the reaction time after removing the baseline uh, reaction time, uh, after taking away the baseline reaction time. So this is really the time to make a decision inverted. And on this side is their uh, uh, the metric that they had, which was an L1 distance between the vector of firing rates uh, for the two images i and j. And they found that, uh, so this was for, for a pair of 12 images. And uh, for each pair, you essentially have how much, what is the inverse of the reaction time, uh, inverse of the uh, decision time, and the L1 uh, um, uh, distance between the two vectors. And they lined up quite, quite well. They got a 95%. So the p value? Ah, the p-value is, is the confidence associated. Right, no, I, I was asking whether that's the p-value. That's uh, the p-value. Yes, okay. correct. Yeah. So this is the confidence with which uh, um, you will believe in this particular linear fit. And this is quite amazing. Um, so this is uh, this is essentially the experiment that they reported, and um, these uh, neuroscience papers are actually quite interesting to read because here is the hypothesis, and then they ask a lot of questions. Uh, associated with uh, can one really believe this particular result and they go and address all of uh, 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 address some of these questions to some extent when I saw this though uh, um, I, I was a little unsure because uh, um, I was a little skeptical because uh, first of all the measurements were made on macaque monkeys and uh, the experiments were done on humans. And uh, the fact that they cor there was this 95% correlation was kind of surprising uh, to me. But uh, uh, Arun Sripati reassured me that at least as far as uh, the visual pathway is concerned, it is believed that uh, we are not too different uh, in terms of the activity at the inferotemporal cortex. Uh, um, we are not too different. That, that's, that's the belief right now. And uh, uh, in any case, the other point that I was a little skeptical about was that on the macaque monkeys, the responses were to single images, whereas on uh, the human subjects, the human subjects were asked to look at uh, one among six different messages. So we might combine things in somewhat different ways. So it wasn't clear how one could essentially say that from this matchup, um, uh, the uh, there is indeed a verification of the hypothesis uh, that uh, they have. Um, the other thing was the, the other thing that I was a little skeptical about was this ad hoc subtraction of crudely estimated baseline reaction time. So this was also something that uh, I wasn't uh, uh, sure about, and I'm not going to address either of these two uh, things here. But there are two definite questions that uh, uh, people uh, that engineers can certainly ask, and that is why L1. Why did they choose L1 metric and why did it match? So that's a, that's a question that we can definitely try to address. And why 1 over S versus the neuronal metric? And uh, if you, uh, many of you were there 
for Tara stock. And so both of the, uh, are, why L1 is perhaps not answered, but certainly the 1 over S uh, is kind of answered if you take uh, Chernoff's viewpoint. And I'll come to that in a minute. So the, uh, when I saw these results and the matchup with L1, my question was, is there a model that will explain this particular behavior? And when I ask for a model, I'm not asking for a sort of uh, full-fledged theory, but simply a model which will perhaps capture some features, distort certain other features, but still be able to explain this particular behavior where you get something about, if not L1, maybe something else and uh, on, the, uh, on the abscissa and something that tells why 1 over s should be the right thing on the ordinate. Can I just, maybe you, you said this back, I mean, the, so you said the, the experiments were five for some duration of time before they, that they were given the human subjects to, to make Yeah, so about five seconds. And, and then... Uh, what was the response time in the order of? Uh, it was of the order of, uh, I think uh, it ranged from milli hundreds of milliseconds uh -huh. in some cases. It was quite instantaneous. Mm -hmm. After subtraction of the baseline reaction time to about uh, uh, three seconds or so. And there were some cases which okay, went so beyond then, five then seconds. Then, then it is, you are really in turn off. In the sense that, that you're, you don't have a yeah. So I should mention that uh, the subjects were asked not to guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, you are uh, the subjects are sure so you, you that there is the odd one. The yeah. So uh, no guessing. So the subjects were reasonably sure so of we, the answer. We turn off is the right <laughs> Regarding the reaction time, I was wondering if anybody's looked into Uh, that's a very interesting question and this is something that uh, uh, my neuroscientist uh, colleague is looking at but I don't know I won't be able to answer that question here. That's uh, associated with uh, this particular skepticism that I pointed out. Um, but uh, as an engineer I'll, and in trying to give an engineering viewpoint to this I'll essentially focus on these two questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, so even I are, so it's, it's a big debate yeah, it's in neuroscience. Hmm. So, yeah, you could, if, if, that's probably the, the simplest thing that it's like the poor man's thing to do. And then, if, uh, I mean, I guess the first thing is if you don't see that much changes in the rates, then afterwards perhaps you start to see the the temporal sequencing of the firing, but if you wanted to do something that's very, very quick. Then it's just, just the firing the rate, yeah. But it's, as he pointed out, it's a big debate whether uh, um, there is something. I think uh, it's context specific. Yeah. What brain area is that? It's not a uniform answer. So Sripati and Olsen uh, did propose a model and this was in, some, in terms of accumulating confidence, etc., and uh, stopping when a certain threshold is reached, they somehow hit the nail on the head, but without uh, um, having a statistical viewpoint at all. And uh, what I want to uh, point, uh, what we wanted to add is um, bring Chernoff's viewpoint in here, and then change this L1 to something which is relative entropy based. And that Chernoff's viewpoint will also say why 1 over s is the, is the right thing to compare with a relative entropy metric. So let's get to that. So we wanted a better model grounded in a theory. And to some extent, I think uh, uh, Tara has uh, stolen the thunder. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, OK. So what would the prefrontal cortex do? if it got observations from the IT cortex and could control the eye. So this, this was the question that we really asked ourselves. So in a sense, we are essentially trying to give an engineering viewpoint, uh, or at least an engineer's viewpoint, to this, uh, uh, to this problem of biological vision. Uh, so it's a biased engineer's view, but uh, nevertheless, let me go ahead and uh, give my viewpoint. So here is the uh, model that we came up with. It's 
naturally an active sequential hypothesis testing problem with the following ingredients. So the ingredients are, well there is a certain hypothesis of where the odd object is and what the odd object is. Uh, the location of the odd object is A and what the odd object, whether it is, whether it is I or J, is the other uh, um, uh, component of this hypothesis. Um, w then what we thought we would do is we would think of dividing time into slots and then uh, uh, have a control given observations up to uh, and decisions in all the previous slots. You can either decide to stop and declare where the oddball image is and what it is or you can decide to continue and draw one more sample which is like directing the eye to focus on a certain location let's say B which is one of the six locations and draw some observation. Okay. And what this observation is going to be would be firing rates of neurons when you're trained on that particular when the eye is uh, trained on that particular uh, uh, location. So the observation if the object is in location B, uh, um, if the uh, um, sorry, if the action is to look at location B and the object there is K, then you're going to see n Poisson point processes with rates lambda sub K of n. Okay. And uh, if these are independent processes, then uh, a sufficient statistic is just the number of points that you have uh, here. Um, so the firing rate suffices in that case, under in this assumption, yeah, <laughs> under this assumption. And the performance criterion is the Chernoff uh, uh, performance criterion. Uh, the requirement will be that for any hypothesis, your policy should be such that the probability of error given that particular hypothesis <coughs> is less than or equal to epsilon. And what we will try to do is look at the trade-off between delay and epsilon. Okay, so this was the uh, model that we thought of. And of course, Chernoff had an answer uh, to this question in 1956 or f oh, I think it's 59. This should be 59. So let pi of epsilon be the set of all policies such that uh, under this policy and under the hypothesis H, the probability that there is an error be less, uh, is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, no matter what the hypothesis is. So this is the requirement for uh, a, a policy. And what Chernoff uh, proved was that um, given a certain hypothesis H, let tau denote the stopping time for a decision okay, under a policy here. Then in the limit as epsilon goes to zero, so your performance is essentially demanding that your probability of error go to zero under that uh, asymptotics, the minimum time, minimum expected time for any policy, and he did demonstrate such a policy as we saw in, uh, in Tara's talk, uh, uh, the minimum time is at least log of epsilon absolute value divided by this uh, uh, quantity here d sub h and what is d sub h? d sub h is essentially uh, the relative entropy um, between uh, two different uh, distributions and let me tell you what these two distributions are. If your action is A and the hypothesis is H then you're essentially under the hypothesis H you're going to essentially get some observations and those observations are distributed according to this uh, distribution Q A H oh, sorry this uh, should be H one of them should be H prime okay one of them should be H prime I apologize for that uh, so uh, second one should be H prime and uh, so D sub H is essentially the maximum of the worst case relative entropy averaged across all the possible actions. So you're taking some random actions. The random actions are distributed according to this mu sub a. And if you do this, then you, you essentially have a certain distinguishing capability between the hypothesis h and h prime. And that's characterized by this particular quantity. And what you're trying to capture here, what uh, this expression captures, is the worst possible h prime that's um, that's closest to H in terms of this distinguishing capability. And what you try to do is maximize your strategy. So this mu uh, is your strategy uh, uh, of randomized actions. You try to maximize this to minimize, uh, you, uh, to be able to distinguish between H and the, uh, and the worst case hypothesis H prime. So here's the interpretation. Uh, use mu star H to denote this argmax here 
for each hypothesis h the best strategy after some initial searching is a randomized strategy designed for the worst alternative h prime not equal to h and the uh, uh, the average delay is essentially the average of these across the priors which is the uniform prior and the delay here will be measured in slots how many how much time do I have? about 15 minutes yeah okay so let's uh, cut to the chase and I'll just tell you what this particular uh, so what this essentially tells you is that in the limit as epsilon goes to zero your uh, expected time to make a decision is going off to infinity but then if you normalize it by log epsilon it tells you at what rate it goes to infinity and perhaps that rate at which it goes to infinity is a good neuronal metric to have okay so that's that's the basic idea and so let's go and uh, calculate those things for the specific uh, n Poisson point processes. One can actually do that and here is the relative entropy between two Poisson point processes with rates lambda i and lambda j and uh, th this, is the, uh, this is the relative entropy rates normalized over time. Okay. And then what we do is we average it across the n neurons as well and that's uh, essentially going to be our substitute for uh, the L1 metric. So instead of the L1 metric they should have actually ch taken this and not the L1 metric. Uh, then the average delay per unit time per neuron per this quantity the uh, 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 that essentially captures the probability of error uh, when the oddball image is i is essentially something that you can compute explicitly in terms of these relative entropies i sub ij and i sub ji and one can essentially get an expression of this sort. Okay. Let's call this uh, d tilde of ij. What we must actually plot is 1 over s and d tilde ij and check whether they match up. Okay, so let's see whether they indeed do. And so here is the modified uh, punchline. They indeed do, but the, uh, the correlation is not 0.95 as they got with, uh, with L1 distance. It's about, it's only 90 percent, uh, but somehow with, uh, with a somewhat larger uh, confidence. Now, we wanted to go one step further. We wanted to check whether uh, uh, if we are trying to build, go towards building a theory, the theory should essentially say something which will enable one to test the theory itself, in a sense. So can we get something to test this theory? That was the uh, next question that, uh, that we asked ourselves. So how close is our model, and that's what we have, to, uh, to a theory? So uh, we wanted to get a certain higher order prediction. Okay. And the prediction is that if the hypothesis is H, then the actions are asymptotically going to be distributed according to this uh, optimal uh, policy. So the Chernoff theory essentially says that it ought to be uh, distributed according to this uh, mu star H. Is that indeed the case? Can we design experiments? Um, and uh, see uh, whether that is indeed the case. So let's go and see what the uh, uh, optimal policy is in this particular case. So um, uh, for, for this specific setting you can actually get what the uh, uh, optimal policy is in terms of the IJI and the I, IJs. And uh, if one makes the assumption that the I, IJ and IJI, which is just the relative entropy between the Poisson point process vector, uh, vector of Poisson point process with uh, a certain rate and another one with a certain different rate vector, uh, if those two are roughly the same, then one expects that on the oddball image, we are, uh, the subject is going to uh, focus roughly three-eighths of the time. And the remaining time is essentially going to be split across all the other images, roughly an eighth of the time. Okay, so this is the kind of prediction that we can come up with and we can try to see whether this prediction is indeed uh, 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 something that one can verify. Okay, so towards this. And you can ver this, verify this on humans now, right? Yeah, so this is completely on humans. Yeah, that's, so let me uh, tell you the next experiment that we have. Um, so for that I'll have to pull up. Uh, The original information came with eye movements only on the, uh, oh. on the macaques and uh, that was to ensure that the macaques were focused on the plus sign. 
uh, just to uh, so they identified the uh, deviation as the uh, images were being shown and they found that it was about uh, the images were about two degrees eccentricity uh, but they found that the macaques were focused on the plus sign it was about uh, the uh, standard deviation was about a tenth of that so the juice was really working so here is an experiment uh, that we designed <laughs> okay, so press any key to begin. Okay, so um, in uh, so there are some dots that are uh, uh, floating across, uh, and uh, there are eight images in all. One of them has the drift in one particular direction. All the others have drift uh, in the other. Uh, uh, all the others have drift along the same direction. The odd one here, it's quite clear is the one at uh, the bottom right okay so that's that one so it's been highlighted so this is the one where the uh, difference is about 60 degrees okay and this is something that uh, somehow we are able to capture rather immediately and i'll come to that in a minute there's another experiment where the difference in angle is not 60 degrees but 15 degrees so let me put that here okay so can you tell where the odd one is? Is it to the right or to the left? It's to the right. This will tell you where the odd one is. Huh? So this is something which you had to look for quite some time. You had to accumulate a certain amount of confidence and then... Uh, um <laughs> Okay, so let me uh, get back to the presentation. Okay, so the prediction was that three eighth of the time you should be after um, uh, um, you start looking at the images. Eventually, you should be uh, if you look at the histogram of uh, 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 where all on which all objects you are focused. Roughly three eighth of the time, you should be on the odd one as you're trying to accumulate confidence and then roughly an eighth of the time must be spread across all the other images okay. so here is uh, what was found uh, the picture is somewhat unclear this is for the case when the difference in the angle of the drift was 15 degrees this is something where the subject actually took about 50 seconds so uh, that's indicated here it, the subject took some time to figure out where it was the subject is um, uh, Koshi the, 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 the person uh, um, uh, the, the first uh, uh, the, the student who has been working on this so the odd image is essentially here and uh, what uh, we noticed is that we were focusing mostly on either this one or that one after having figured out roughly uh, where the odd one was but this is what I find myself doing. I find myself comparing them pairwise next to each other. Next to each other. After you have figured out where the odd one is. For some reason, yeah. we want to be economical in our eye movements. Okay, and that's something that we have not modeled at all. Okay, so that was the first thing. So, and here is some, uh, uh, we had a prediction, 3 8 and 1 8. 3 8 on the odd one, 1 8 on all the others. And that's something that has utterly failed here because uh, uh, this one here essentially indicates what fraction of the time is focused on uh, uh, the, um, uh, the odd one and uh, sorry the, the blue is on the odd one and this is on the odd one and the two things and the two objects next to the odd one and a lot of time uh, a disproportionately large amount of time is actually focused on that and that happens actually towards the end so this is if uh, this is the time at which the decision at the uh, at, uh, at at the time at which the key was pressed, this is what happens in t minus uh, in t naught minus six in that last six seconds, and most of the time is essentially focused on that particular region alone, the odd one, and the two ones uh, uh, on either side of the odd one. So we had a prediction, and the prediction has essentially failed, and that's because we did not model in our uh, uh, experiments or in uh, in our uh, theory we did not model uh, the cost of what are called saccades which are these eye movements and there is some cost associated with it and this is something that we have to bring into account mm -hmm. in order to explain the behavior. I would, I would guess you'd say that's our set of data, you know, that we feel good when we see a difference. You know, and we, you know, it's, it's rewarding to see that difference. 
Uh, just the fact that uh, lost in the fields is uh, in some sense you're essentially uh, and you want to see the difference and if uh, no there is a certain thing associated with uh, you, uh, you're focusing you're shifting your focus between two regions and you're capturing whether the two images are the same but and there is some cost associated with uh, the movement imagine the relative entropy when two objects are next to each other, how much confidence you get by looking at those two that are next to each other as opposed to looking far away. that are far away. And I think that would be a good measure to, to figure out. Because because your initial uh, comparisons are always pairs that are the same size relative to each other as mm -hmm. opposed to um, a larger field and, and mm -hmm. general. So mm -hmm. I think that would be yeah, so it would be an interesting thing to uh, to model these effects. That's something that we haven't done at all. Yeah, kind of contrast also, because contrast to me, the closer things are, like visual field, get the on off. So if things are close, you're more likely to see the contrast rather than. And if they are far apart. Yeah. yeah. So but you've told us a priori that there is one different and all the other ones are the same. Yes, if, correct. Right, your a priori information is already on the differential. That's correct, yes. If you had given us six completely different images and you told us in advance which one we're looking for, we wouldn't be able to do this. That's right, yes. Right, so, so uh, but then I, uh, I mean, uh, I do want to find out which the odd one is. And I want to figure out how you are actually doing it. Right, so I want you to compare between two images which you know are likely to be the same. So we do want to compare our theory with this particular information that I have given you and how you use it. So. Uh, it's important that only one of them is odd. Josh, I have uh. an experiment uh, question. You know, when the stuff gets harder and harder to discriminate, uh, you're going to be wrong sometimes. Yes. Sometimes they, there's like a psychometric curve that people generate, which is sort of the fraction of time you're right and wrong as a function of how hard it is. Did, did yeah, so we have been collecting some information on that. We haven't processed it. In fact, one of the things that we want to check is calculate the probability of error and go back to check whether uh, Chernoff is indeed really useful in trying to uh, explain this experiment to a greater extent because we can actually compare that slope with the probability of error that we get. So there is some additional information that this straight line actually gives us. Or maybe you should condition it. Like those experiments that are near turn off, do they follow the, the right pattern of the policy? Because if I'm not following them, I'm doing something, you know what I mean? Like throw away the oddballs where people who are making decisions that are not. Yeah, but uh, we can gather. You will just do something really odd. So I might be the one who is wasting your so I think we should uh, we should throw away data at the subject level whenever such a thing happens because uh, we can get information. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh. It's like I'm asking whether you threw away subject at such a, you know like are these measurements that you're saying doesn't support your conjecture? Are they across all? subjects or only like there was a good match with the time? So the uh, experiments that uh, were done earlier, which I reported, those were uh, the ones that uh, essentially led to the uh, uh, points on the plot were all good ones uh, okay. in the sense that a if there was an error that was thrown away. Okay. So only the correct valid points essentially contributed to those, po Th those so points. And then you condition on those good ones, you calculated the, the yeah, that's correct. So on those good ones, you identified what the uh, uh, correlation was. The other one is what I think Tara has been, uh, uh, Tara spoke about, uh, which was uh, broad and shallow search versus narrow and deep. And you essentially go, uh, take a step back from operating at rate zero, and then you try to get some positive uh, rates. That seems to be happening in the circumstance when you are actually looking at uh, trying to find out the difference between uh, uh, trying to find out the odd one when the difference is 60 degrees. So here is the example where uh, uh, this, this was the odd one and it was 60 degrees off from the others. And somehow uh, what happened was uh, you could essentially get a broad field view. So the, uh, these are the focus points. So uh, you can see that uh, the saccades were essentially measured roughly about um, uh, a point here means that there was some focus at that point for about 
uh, 20 milliseconds or so and this is essentially the uh, set of points at which you focus and it appears that to begin uh, the subject looked at uh, this point and somehow the subject was gathering uh, uh, an overall impression of in which direction the points were flowing and that kind of gave an indication as to in which region the odd particular uh, the odd uh, image was so the subject went here checked a few things and then zoomed in on the right one so it looks like there is something of this sort that happens when the difference is rather wild but when you have to integrate a lot and uh, identify where the odd one is you're actually focusing on each individual object Six by six squares. Like, uh -huh. uh, what if you had? I was just interested in. I wonder if there would be. You could localize more on what they're. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, speak about this softly. Okay. So. Um, so we seem to be doing um, uh, some sort of a broad and shallow search first and then we seem to be zooming in to the right things but it depends on the uh, uh, types of images uh, so to some extent that seems to be happening and uh, it would be interesting to model that and verify that via experiments as well there are of course two other aspects that an engineer should be uh, looking at in trying to uh, uh, um, uh, in trying to give an explanation for uh, these observations and that is about storage of beliefs during the course of the experiment so we don't seem to be uh, we probably just capture some broad uh, features maybe the odd one is to the right or to the left uh, or you uh, you don't store the entire belief vector but you just keep the top one in in mind and then you go and do some additional searches so it would be interesting to come up with some predictions and then test those predictions uh, if you have any ideas I would like to hear them and then uh, the other interesting aspect is we really don't know what these rates of the Poisson point processes are in reality what we are trying to do is we are trying to compare two images which we know are the same and we are, or which we know are likely to be the same and we are testing whether they are equal to each other so in a sense we are essentially doing some distribution free uh, um, uh, search here and that's another interesting uh, a problem that uh, is worth looking at so I'll stop at this point. One of the things that, um, at least that at UCSD, the class that people do is they try to uh, normalize for the periphery vision. Uh -huh. right? These objects have very different, uh, so when I focus somewhere with a particular zone, what I can see other places, so they kind of block it out. I was wondering if you thought about doing that. So that's yeah, so the, the way we actually tried to block it out was essentially trying to get the images to be really difficult to distinguish. Uh, that means that the subject has to focus on this and accumulate sufficient confidence. So this but is a challenge. Like 60 degrees is immediate. Yeah. Uh, you're able to identify where the odd one is because of peripheral vision. Yeah. So you somehow look at the center and you're able to get the general drift and place where the odd one is. We wanted to get that out of the way. So. 15 degrees or thereabouts was the right kind of experiment uh, to look at. How many pictures were actually shown to like one subject during the course of the experiment? In the uh, initial set of experiments, I think, uh, uh, yeah, well, you get tired after some time. Uh, so because like the third point I'm really interested because when you see something for long enough, you the brain has a classifier, right? So it, it sees like overall patterns. So if someone asks me, how, like, you know, do you see something different with me? And I've been seeing them for like a year. I, I do not see because I've been used to like the general features, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's to answer your specific question, how, how long did the experiment last? Um, in, as far as the first experiment is concerned, I think uh, uh, it, it went on for about uh, an hour. And then beyond that time, the subjects would get tired. So I think it wasn't useful to go beyond that. Um, to uh, get to this particular point, typically what we store is some gross features of the belief vector. Um, we, uh, it, it would be interesting to find what these features are. And we must design experiments to capture those things. I don't know how to do that. If you have some ideas, do let me know. Well, I think we 
need to move on, but uh, thanks for syndrome. Thank you.